All right, so, so sorry about the late start. Let's just go ahead and get, uh, get into it. Uh, I apologize, it's only an hour. I'm just really swamped this week. Uh, with the registration opening up, I've spent like the last two days just doing overrides and stuff like that because Ariel's not, uh, she's not here right now. Uh, she's on vacation. And so uh, I apologize for not getting an example exam up quite yet. I was working on it today. And as soon as I get that done, I'll post it as well. But as long as you're comfortable with the material on the homework, I can tell you the exam material is going to be very, very similar to what you've been seeing on the homework. And so the best place for you to study would be the homework. Um, and you're going to see essentially homework problems on the exam. Um, you just might get a better idea for kind of scope um, or, or the, the types of subpart questions I might be asking. But realistically, it's, it's not going to be any surprise what you see. Now, uh, I only had two requests or two questions about the exam uh, on, on D2L. So we'll just go through those really quickly. Um, so it says, on the D2L announcements, it's mentioned that the exam will cover topics from lectures 7 through 12. Um, however, you said in class, the exam will only cover homework 4 and 5. Um, I'm a little confused because homework 3 was based on lecture 7. So is the exam now on homework 3 through 5. So I wouldn't call it a gray line, but I would say that um, if we're looking at the lectures right here, lecture 7 is shear and moment diagrams. Um, and you did shear and moment diagrams for exam number 1. And that was kind of the last two problems, eight and nine. You were doing shear and moment diagrams and normal force axial diagrams for a beam and then for a frame. And so I'm not going to have you do an in-depth shear and bending moment diagram for the exam. But where does like our moment diagram come into play for like homeworks four and five, or at least homework four? It's the moment equations. And so in order, uh, part of this material was like how do you get a moment equation from the external loading and the geometry on a structure. And so that's fair game on the exam because it, it, it kind of works into the deflection by integration method. And so you need to know it for that. I might ask you to like plot out what the moment diagram looks like, but you're not going to, it's not going to be like a full problem. It just might be part of like a deflection by integration problem. So really what we're focusing on, if I had like um, three questions on the exam and I'm not saying that I do, I would have deflection by integration, deflection by superposition, and a virtual work uh, on like a truss type problem. Because that's really all, all that we've covered. Because if I look at like lecture eight, trusses, axial force diagrams, right, that lends itself to the virtual work by uh, virtual work for trusses type application. Lecture 9, deflection by integration. Lecture 10, oops, uh, sorry, lecture 11. Lecture 10 was just a SAP lab. You're not going to have anything SAP related. Um, 11 was deflection by superposition. And then 12 was virtual work for trusses. So that's where moment diagrams and axial force diagrams just work themselves into deflection by integration, and then virtual work for trusses. That's how you're going to see them on the exam. But it wouldn't be the traditional, here's a beam, show me the axial force, uh, shear force, and bending moment diagrams. It's only going to focus on just the moment equation part of it. So hopefully that clears up uh, that confusion. So I apologize for that. Um, the other question I haven't looked at yet. Oh, yeah, boundary conditions. So this is a really good one. Um, a lot of people often struggle with this. And I don't think that your book does you any favors by changing up how X is measured for the beam. Um, and so let's just talk about that for a second, talking about boundary conditions and maybe, maybe even more importantly, continuity conditions as well too. Uh, real quick, can somebody check and make sure that's recording? Um, I think I pressed the button. If you can look on the screen and just make sure it says, that's fine, it shouldn't be. A, okay, great. Okay, so let's talk about boundary conditions because for deflection by integration, I mean, this is a, an issue that comes up in strength of materials uh, when you first learn about it. And, and this is a good time to kind of refresh your memory about it, but it still tends to, tends to be a struggle uh, for a lot of people. 
So when we're talking about boundary conditions, we're talking about deflection by integration method. And so if you recall for, let's say, a simple beam like this, a cantilever with, let's say, a single point load on the end of it, if I want to figure out what the elastic curve equation is, so for example, like the deflection is a function of x, I need to do two sets of integration to the function m over ei with respect to x. And I'm just going to say x is measured from the left of the beam to the right. Each time you integrate, you are going to get a constant of integration. So the first time that I integrate, I'm going to get the equation for the slope. I'm going to get, uh, so, so if I integrate, I'm going to get basically theta or dy dx, whichever way you want to call it, angle or slope, for a small amount. If we're measuring radians, it's not going to be any different. It is equals the first integral of m over ei with respect to x. So we're going to get some, you know, some number, um, well, a, a couple different terms. I don't want to just say a number, but we're going to get, let's say, like some x squared term times some number, we'll say a, and then some number maybe times x, maybe if we have a relatively simple loading, we're going to get like just bx plus um, c potentially for that. But some sort of polynomial, and maybe I shouldn't even use c because we're about to use that in a second, so I'll just call it d. But this is just a placeholder for some polynomial equation where x has varying orders, uh, you know, uh, x squared, x to the first, whatever. So I'm going to get some function plus c1. And then when I go to calculate y and I do my double integration, I'm going to get some other slightly longer function plus c1 times x plus c2. And that's just a, a process of the antiderivative function is that we get a constant of integration that we don't know. And the only way that we can solve for that is with known values of theta or deflection at a specific value of x. So all I need to do to figure out what C1 or C2 is, is find a location that I know exactly what theta is, and I, and I can describe that location in terms of what x is equal to. And so for this system right here that's relatively simple, what are my boundary conditions? What, what are the locations that I know exactly what theta or exactly what deflection is going to be equal to? So at, so at x equals 0, what do I know? Yeah, theta equals 0. So another way to write this that's pretty common would be theta at x equals 0 equals 0. That's the way I prefer to write it, but either way is it, totally fine. All we're saying is, look, when I know uh, at this location x equals 0, I know for sure that theta equals 0. And so all that I have to do for that is I plug in zeros for all of my x's, I plug in 0 for theta, and then I calculate what c1 is equal to. Relatively straightforward. But that's not my only boundary condition. And, and, and this is a boundary condition because at this location, we often draw the boundary conditions two different ways. So I drew a straight line, a horizontal line parallel to the beam, and that's telling me the slope equals zero at this point. What do you suppose that solid dot means? If I'm not talking about rotation, what do you suppose that dot is talking about? Yeah, deflection has to be zero there. It can't move up or down at this location. So that dot is telling me that y at x equals zero equals zero. All right. Angle at x equals zero is zero, and deflection at x equals zero also has to be equal to zero. Now, where I see the mistakes happening all the time is that And again, your, your book likes to play kind of fast and loose with where they're measuring x from. If I were to measure x from the right going to the left, and again, there's, there's good reasons to do it, especially now that we're looking at virtual work for frames. There can be very compelling reasons 
to measure x from the right of this beam pointed to the left. Smaller moment equations means that when I multiply a virtual moment equation with a real moment equation, I don't get like six different terms, right? So there, there are compelling reasons to do it. You just need to be really careful if you're doing this, especially if you're doing it for the same beam, starting one moment equation from the left, starting another moment equation from the right, because what are my boundary conditions here? Uh, let's just go ahead and call this x2. I'll call the first one x1. If I was doing the boundary conditions off of x2 as how I'm measuring the location of my beam, talking about the left side of the beam, I'll call it point A, how can I describe point A in terms of x2? At point A, x2 equals L. So it's the same process, but now we're talking about x2 equals L, and so now deflection at x2 equals L, and rotation at x2 equals L is equal to zero. Now, these two equations here and these two equations here are saying the exact same thing. It's just our frame of reference is different. Is x measured from the left going to the right? Well, that's the x1 type equations. If you want to flip it around and have x measured from the right to the left, then you need these equations for your boundary conditions. And so that's the, that, the boundary conditions are an easy place to get messed up, but it gets even worse when we talk about a more complex loading. And then our boundary conditions, we start calling them continuity conditions because instead of knowing exactly what they're equal to, you know, rotation being zero or deflection being zero, where two moment equations meet or hand off one to the other, we don't know what the deflection or the rotation is exactly. We don't know the, the numerical value. We just know, look, it can't be different if we're measuring it using x1 or measuring it using x2. We can't have like a big jump in our beam unless we have a release, and in most of these cases we don't. So we, all that we know is, look, the deflection based off x1 has to equal the deflection based off x2. Likewise, the angle has to be the same one side to the other as well. We can't have a kink in our beam unless we have a hinge, and we haven't really done many examples like that either. So let's look at the example for the continuity conditions where I'm going to have the same beam, but now I'm going to make the second half of the beam, well not second half, let's actually not make it simple. Let's say four feet and six feet. This is point A, this is point B, this is point C. So now, it, how many section cuts do I need to fully describe the moment across the length of this beam? I need two, because I, I have one dis, excuse me, I have a discontinuity at A, at B, and at C. At each of those points, three discontinuities. I have the end of the beam here, end of the beam there, and then here at B, I have a load beginning or ending, which means that's a discontinuity as well too. So I'm going to make one section cut right through here, another section cut right through here, and now we can decide, well, how do we want to measure that location of this section cut? And so one option would be, I'm going to measure it from the left to the right, and I'll call that like x1, and I could also measure the second section cut, and I'm going to go ahead and call that x2, but there's nothing wrong or nothing keeping me for either of these to measure it from the other side, and I'm just gonna go ahead and call that, we'll call that like x1 prime, and I know this is inconsistent with how we just did it a second ago, so I apologize, and x2 prime. Or maybe we can, maybe it would be better to call it like x1l, x2l, x1r, x2r. Maybe that's a better way to do it, I don't know. Measuring the location of the section cut from the left or from the right is completely valid, but we just need to be consistent and be really careful when we start looking at, well, when these transition at point B, what does that continuity equation look like? So let's look at this uh, first in terms of X1. So 
Um, let's first for this system, let's list off all of our boundary conditions and then we'll do our continuity conditions. And we'll do it first for like XL and they'll do it second if we're measuring it from the right. So here, continuity conditions and then boundary conditions. So we already said the boundary condition, if we're measuring X from the left, is all at this fixed support. And so I can say that the rotation at X1 L, oops, equals zero, has to be zero. And the deflection at X1 L equals zero, has to be zero. Now, can I say that the deflection at X2L equals zero is also zero? Because as I look down here, X2L is still equal to zero at A. I mean, X1L is zero at A, X2L is zero at A. Do I get four boundary conditions? Can I say that where X2 equals zero, the slope has to be zero? No and why not? I mean, if, it was, if X2L was applicable the entire length of the beam, absolutely. But is this section cut, this second section cut, is, does it apply to the entire length of the beam? No, what's the domain of, let's say, X2L? Yeah, X2L. So let's go ahead and just say, uh, we'll just look at the domain and, and say X1L and X2L. What is the domain of X2L? How could I describe that? What is X2L? Well, it only applies between B and C, right? Because that, it's capturing the effects of this distributed load, and that distributed load only exists between B and C. So that's the only place that the free body diagram based off this section cut is going to be valid. Because as soon as I go past C, right, then I'm off the beam, it shouldn't be applicable there. If I use the free body diagram for the section cut and I keep on moving it back and back and back, over here, I'm outside of that distributed load and all of a sudden my free body diagram is going to show a distributed load that shouldn't exist. And so the second section cut is only applicable between B and C. And so what is B equal to for X2? How, how would I describe this point in terms of the distance from here, uh, from here to here? Four. Just four, four feet. That is the beginning of the applicability of this section cut at four feet. Any X value less than four, I can't use my X2L equation. It's not valid. And then point C, what would that coordinate be? So the question is where, are we measure, where is X2L equal to zero? That's point A. We, we measure, that's our datum. And I get it, it doesn't apply here. If X2 was equal to zero, I, my moment equation wouldn't be valid, but that doesn't mean that X2 can't be measured from there. So X2 is measured from A, that's where X2L equals zero but the moment equation based off of X2L only starts to be applicable here all the way to here. So what is the X coordinate of C if I'm measuring it from A? Just 10 feet, the entire length. Is this a, a length from here to here? It's 10 feet. Okay, so then what is the domain of the moment equation based off of X1L? zero, which is point A, to four, which is point B. Exactly right. So if you make a moment equation based off X2L, you can't, that moment equation is not valid less than four or greater than 10 value of X. Same thing with your moment equation based off X1 of L in that free body diagram. It's only applicable if you're plugging in values of X of zero to four. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about measuring from the right side. And let's talk about X, one, R. And let's talk about X, two, R. All right, let's start with X, one, R first. So that's this section cut right here between A and B. 
So if I'm measuring it, again, the x's with the r subscript are starting at zero at point C and then increasing as we move to the left. That's what this diagram is showing us. It's saying this vertical line is zero and then the direction of the arrow is pointed the positive direction of XR. All right, so if this is zero, what is B? What is the coordinate at B? Right, six feet. And then what is the coordinate at A? 10 feet. And then for the second section cut, it starts here, it ends, so it starts at point C, it ends at point B, so what's the coordinate at point C? Zero, and then at point B, it's six feet. It's the same exact procedure, but uh, I, I am seeing a lot of uh, free body diagrams that are not being explicit about either, or just maybe it's not intuitive that like this is the zero point, so I've recommended to some students to draw a zero there just to help you out. Another thing that I'm seeing with some free body diagrams is I'm seeing some free body diagrams. Let's say it's like this one right here. And let's say that I'm measuring, uh, this is like my X2, or, sorry, X1 section cut. So like this is X1R. So this is helpful because it's showing that X is measured from this point on the right at zero to the left but just extend that arrow all the way because the entire length is X1, R. And I think that if you're not showing all of the dimensions of each of these elements or wherever the resultants are, stuff like that, I, I think you're gonna get confused. So do yourself a favor, extend that and show it the entire length of the free body diagram. Because that is what this is showing is that it is the distance from where X begins all the way to the section cut. And this dimension is critical when you start doing your equilibrium equations. Okay, so with that in mind, with that kind of domain discussion ironed out, what is my boundary condition for measuring X from the right going to the left? The only place we look at boundary conditions or the only place that we have valid boundary conditions for the most part is at supports. And so which of my XR equations or which version of XR is valid at point A? Is it X1R or X2R? Yeah, X1R goes from B to A. And again, you might call this X2R and this X1R. It doesn't really matter. We're just doing it schematically. But this would be X1R equal to what? What does point A, what, what is X equal to at point A if we're measuring it from the right? Yeah, the entire length, or in this case, we just call it 10 feet because we're given that value. But you're exactly right, the full length of the beam. Okay, we don't get four boundary conditions because X2R is only valid between C and B. We can't apply it at A because it's no longer valid. Okay, so now let's talk about this idea of continuity conditions because there's actually a little bit of crossover here as well too. So let's talk about continuity conditions and this is where things can start to get a little bit um, tricky At point B, and we're just focusing on X's measure from the left here, at point B, the equations based off X1 and X2 have to hand off to each other. I'm gonna be able to calculate the deflection and rotation of this beam between A and B based off my equations relative to X1. But then as soon as I get to B, I now have to transition to my second set of equations based off X2. But they can both be valid at B, but we need to make sure they have the same value at B. I don't want to have a beam that when it deflects, it all of a sudden jumps up and does that at point B. Right? This can't happen because I don't have a vertical release in my beam. I mean, it's possible to have a vertical release 
we just don't have one. It's a continuous beam the whole way. Likewise, my beam can't kink like that either. So the deflection needs to be the same at point B whether I'm measuring it based off my equations from X1 or whether I'm measuring it based off my equations on X2. Same thing with the rotation. It has to be the same here whether I'm measuring it with X1 or whether I'm measuring it with X2 equations. And so how can I write that down mathematically? I would have to say that the rotation at X1L equals something has to equal the rotation at X2L equals something. And we're just talking about point B here. So what is point B in terms of X1 value? Yeah, four. Four feet. What about X2 if I'm measuring it from the left? Still just four feet. They're both being measured from the same location. They're both being measured from A going to the right. So that is four feet for both of them. Now, are they both valid when X equals four feet? Yeah, that's inclusive here on this domain. It's inclusive here on this domain. That's the only point that they share. The only point that both X1L equations and X2L equations share is four feet. That's the only one. So at that, when I calculate that, they better be equal in terms of slope, and they better be equal in terms of deflection as well, too. Oops. Y, X2L equals four feet. So this continuity condition works out great to solve for, let's say, like C3 and C4, because I've already solved for C1 and C2, so I already have a fully worked out solution for the deflection or the rotation of the beam between A and B. So before you go into this step to solve for the unknowns, uh, constants of integration, you already have to have a fully worked out function for the deflection uh, and rotation uh, for this first segment. Otherwise, you'd have four unknowns and you'd have two equations and you wouldn't be able to solve for all the unknowns. Okay, the same, uh, this is not where it gets tricky necessarily, but now if we're just measuring everything from the right going to the left, I have the same format, uh, sorry, X1R. So the rotation at X1R equals something has to equal the rotation at X2R equals something. And the same has to be said, oops, did it again, for the deflection. Now the question is, What value am I putting in here to identify point B? Yeah, six for all of them. Super. Okay, so that's not too difficult, but now let's add one more, one more wrinkle here. I'm just gonna go ahead and erase this guy down here. What if I want to do the continuity condition where I'm using, for my first section cut, X1L, and for my section, second section cut, I'm going to use X2R. So it's still the two section cuts that I need. It's still the first section cut between A and B, that's X1L. The second section cut between B and C, I'm now just measuring it from the right. So now for my continuity condition, I need to say that, that theta at X1L equals something equals theta at X2R equals something. It's a little more complex than that. And we, we chatted about this in class a little bit, but what value do I need to put in here for X1L if we're talking about point B? Four feet. And what about for X2R? All right, is that done? Why is that not done? That's exactly right, it's not complete. This is not correct. And why not? Yeah, well, either one. I, one of these needs to be negative. And the reason is, is if I'm measuring X from the left going to the right, a positive slope looks like that, assuming that Y is going upwards. If I'm measuring X from the right going to the left, a positive slope looks like that. 
Again, both of these I'm assuming y is in a consistent direction, so y is either positive up or y is positive down. The point is, for these to be consistent, one of these signs needs to be negative. And so this is a really easy mistake to make, to omit that negative sign. All right, what about the deflection? What about deflection at x1l equals 4 feet equals deflection at x2r equals 6 feet? Do I need a negative sign there? No. If the y direction is consistent, if y is up in both cases or y is down in both cases, the deflection is going to have the same sign. So the two things to be careful about is that if you're not talking about the mid span of a beam, you're going to have different coordinates for x measure from the left and x measure from the right. And with the sign of the rotation, it, one of them needs to be negative. It doesn't matter which one. And that, uh, that's a really small tweak that can really mess up uh, your answer. Um, and that's why I try to avoid this for the most part. But you can see it's like a, it's a give and take because if I'm making a section cut from the right, it might make my moment, my moment equation much easier to deal with. But then I just have to be careful about the constants of integration and how I solve for them. Did you have a... Yeah. So, so I, I do, especially with virtual work, like it's a great tool, but I think just to get this material down, like method of integration, there's so many other things going on, so many other places to make a small mistake that I almost treat this like a, like a sign convention where I just say, just to reduce one more variable, like just to distill it down to kind of the, the pure theory, don't start mixing and matching when you're getting comfortable with the method. Once you get comfortable with it, and some of you are comfortable in strengths, some of you are getting comfortable now, some of you still have some work to do, but when you get comfortable and you really understand what's going on, measuring everything from the left always and going to the right, then start playing around with it. Right? Because it's one thing to learn the theory and get comfortable with it, and then it's another thing to learn how to be efficient in applying the theory. And if you try to do both at the same time, it's going to you know, blow up, right? So number one, get really comfortable with the fewest amount of moving pieces. And then step number two, get comfortable identifying, well, when is it going to be more efficient to measure x from the right? And then keep in mind these other things. But I just want it to be kind of one thing at a time. But there is a lot of value in being able to do it from either side. And I think on the homework, I had you do it from either side for at least one of the problems because I wanted you to look at it. But if you're given a choice and you're not comfortable with this method and you keep on making small mistakes and you're trying to do this stuff, take a step back. Your moment equations might be a little bit trickier if you always measure from the left going to the right, but it's probably going to reduce the number of errors that you're having at this point right here because it's just a lot to keep track of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I draw my body diagram, I'm still drawing point A. So dot point A. Great. Even though I'm added the distributor mode, I know that there is no deflection at point A. So I always think of it as uh, theta x2l equals 0. I'm still having a 0 deflection or rotation. Hmm. Uh, so maybe walk me through that just one more time. So if you make, you're saying your second section cut. The x2l. Yeah, so x2l. So this section cut right here. Right, and then you keep everything to the left of that section cut. Yes. Okay, and then, so if you're looking at it here, oh, okay, I see. So you're wanting to, to use that boundary condition again. So you're basically saying, if, if I have the free body diagram of everything to the left of that section cut, I should be able to say that the rotation at x2l equals zero is going to be zero. Yeah, and that's an easy mistake to make. And because what's actually going on is, uh, let, let's think about it this way. So if I had, let's look at both the x1 function and the x2 function for the entire length of the beam. Um, so let's look at, um, let's 
and I'm just going to kind of make this up because I don't have a good kind of example to go, go by. But let's say it's for the same kind of loading that we're looking at over here. So the equations based off the first section cut off X1 are totally correct between A and B. All right, completely correct. And in this case, they're going to be a linear moment function and it's going to be uh, therefore like a, a third order polynomial for um, the um, deflection, but I'm just going to simplify it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just identify that there's less curvature in segment AB than there is in BC. Would everybody agree with that? There, there's less curvature here than there is here. So I'm just going to draw it like almost like a, like a straight line like that. A little bit of curvature, but not, not a ton. And then I'm going to continue that even though it has, it, its applicability stops right here. I'm just going to continue it with like a dashed line and, and put it right there. For the second section cut, there's like a lot of curvature, right? And the deflection right here has to be the same as the deflection right there, but maybe at that point it starts to get like a lot more curvature, right? So the deflection is the same, the angle is the same, but there's a bunch more curvature there. If I were to extend this equation back along the entire length of the beam, I might get something that like looks like that. And so I know, look, this part is not correct and this part is not correct. Absolutely, I could plug in a value of x equals zero but it's going to give me absolutely the wrong answer because the curvature here and therefore the slope and therefore the deflection is wrong. The curvature is only accurately modeled for the second part of the beam. And so really what you're doing is like this, this value here, where it starts out at when x equals zero, what is that value? It would be like C4. That's what C4 is. It probably starts up here if C4, if, if C4 was zero, this function would start right here and it would look something like that. What we're doing with C4 is we're saying, look, I've got to move this up or down so that this point here is the same as that point there. And it's the same thing with slope as well too. So when you're working with the equation that's valid for one section, even though your free body diagram might look like, hey look, I still see the rest of the beam and it seems like this equation should be valid even outside the domain, it just can't be for this, for this reason. This is kind of the best way that I have to explain it right now. But does that, does that kind of make sense to you? Does that help at all? It's because the curvature is different and therefore even though you see the rest of the beam, you don't get the benefit of one kind of moment equation being applicable across the entire length. Now what we didn't talk about here, and we could talk about this for the whole hour and I apologize for taking maybe a lot of time on this, but I think this, this bears uh, some discussion. Anytime you're making like say the decision to keep everything to the, uh, measure X from the left or measure X from the right, you can always keep either side of the section cut for your free body diagram. If I'm measuring X1 using this X1L, like measure from the left going to the right and here's my first section cut, Here's my first section cut right here. I can keep everything to the left and I, or I could keep everything to the right. It just so happens that if I keep everything to the right, it just makes my geometry a little bit trickier because now this is 10 minus X1L. So again, it'll add an extra term and that's what that's what this is, uh, if you're strategic about it, that's what you can kind of get rid of. But you have a lot of freedom in kind of which side you choose. But I would just 
counsel you against trying to do too much at once. Um, but this is maybe a good kind of intermediate step where always measure X from the left going to the right, but then be strategic about which side of the section cut you keep because there's some strategy in that that can help you out as well too. So even if I get an extra term for length here, maybe it's worthwhile uh, because I have to deal with less on the, uh, than compared to the free body diagram to the left of the section cut. As long as you show your internal resultants the same, like using the sign convention or assume directions of M, it doesn't matter whether you choose everything to the right or choose everything to the left. Okay, so that's, that's a, a big kind of comprehensive discussion about that. What do you want to talk about next? Yeah, Zora, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so let's talk about kind of that example where, um, and again, we talk, we never like had a, pr I don't think I've given you a problem where you've had to do it with two different, two different types of EI. We had that discussion in class and we kind of brainstormed a couple different ways trying to figure out, um, you know, how we could maybe deal with it. I'm not going to give you a calculation problem like that. I could maybe give you like a conceptual problem where I'd have you kind of talk about, well, how might you approach this? But I'm not going to make you do like a deterministic solve for the, um, the rotation. I might just say, you know, how, just like what we talked about in class, like what are some systems you could try to put together that might model it the same way? But so superposition, oops. Um, generally speaking, I would just call this superposition of like for situations that aren't clearly in the tables in the back of your book that I'll provide to you. So one of them that we talked about was um, like an overhang beam like this where we have some sort of load out on the end. And then the other thing that we talked about was uh, maybe like a cantilever beam like this where, yeah, we could have a load out at the end as well too. And so then the question was, how can, I, how can I kind of use the tables in the back of the book and apply them to situations where it's not clearly a situation that's provided for? And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into too heavy of a discussion about these, but let's talk about like this example right here. Uh, well, let's talk about both of them uh, in turn. There, there's a couple different ways to talk about it, and I think that what most people felt relatively comfortable with is looking at this, well, it depends on what we're being asked for. So like the, the example that we were talking about, if we call this point B, if I was looking for like the rotation at point B, what we talked about in class and what's on the slides is looking at a simply supported beam with different loadings that are trying to capture all of the effects that this point load has like up uh, uh, to the rotation at point B. And, and what we ended up talking about is having like two or three different loadings added together that would try to mimic those same effects. Um, and maybe it was just two, but we'll, we'll talk about it in terms of like three. I don't know if we'll need all three. So if this point uh, load is P, and then we'll just go ahead and call this like uh, L1 and L2 for the lengths, you really only get to play around like this where you have like cantilevered portions of your beam. Um, but essentially what we care about or, or what causes rotations and deflections are moments in the beam. And I'm trying to basically like try to mimic as much as possible like the the moment that is going to cause the um, rotation here at B. And one way to do that, or one thing that we can kind of try to capture, would be turning that point load into an equivalent moment, like acting here at B. 
So if I were to apply a couple moment equal to the point load times L2, because basically all that I'm doing here is I'm just taking this point, point moment and I'm trying to figure out what, what kind of effects would it have if I move the effects over to B and just apply those as like a concentrated, uh, say, force or moment. And so here, this couple moment here is going to give me the same exact moment diagram as if this point load was applied. The reactions are going to be the same and therefore because of this type of a structure, the moment diagram is going to look exactly the same as well too. So here, you know, I'm going to have like some vertical load going up, some vertical load going down. So my shear diagram is basically going to be like a negative value the entire distance. And if I were to look at the moment diagram, it's basically just going to look like that. Between, between what I'll call point A and point B. Now, if the point load is still there, then I'm also going to have this other area of moment diagram over here. But between A and B, I get the same triangle that I do whether it's a point load at L2 away or whether I have a couple moment applied at B. I get the same exact moment diagram between A and B. And because what happens, like this moment, part of the moment diagram over here between B and what we'll call C, that doesn't affect the rotation at B at all. That's why we can kind of play around and, and mimic everything that's happening from A until B, which is this one um, equivalent moment applied at B. And the only other thing that we would need to add together would be to move that point load P all the way over here. And then these two loadings added together would give us exactly the same reactions, I'm sorry, at A and B. I said before it, it was a mistake. This moment won't cause the exact same reactions at A and B. It'll cause the exact same reaction at A. I need to apply this point force here as well to get the same uh, overall reaction at B. But as far as the moment diagram, the only thing affecting that is this couple moment. So I think what you should take away, and again, we don't need the third one for this. Where we got a lot more complex is if we started talking about, well, what if I wanted the deflection at C? Like how could I, how, how, if I knew what the rotation was at B, how could I then like try to figure out, well, what would the change in angle and, and change in deflection be if I knew that like, if I knew that this was angling down like that, how much, you know, from this, cord, how much more would it angle down? How much more would it deflect downwards? And that's where it got to be quite a bit more complex, but we could kind of treat this last piece like a, a cantilevered beam because I know what the rotation is here. So a cantilevered beam keeps that same rotation at B because it can't change. And then I just get additional rotation, ad additional deflection. Um, and so that's where things get started kind of getting a lot more complex. And that, that's where kind of the superposition diagram start kind of breaking down. We'll start to, we'll, we'll get pretty close, but we're going to start getting um, effects that, that make them kind of diverge a bit. So it's not like a precise way to go about it. And we had some pretty fun ideas. I would call them fun, different ways that people talked about trying to capture like the difference in EI um, for each of these, like two EI for the left and then EI for the right. So some people were saying, well, let's, let's look at just one beam with two EI and we'll call its length like this. And then let's just add on another beam right here, EI with a point load um, going down on it. Whereas the, the two EI right here, we would have to apply like a couple moment equal to P times L2, and we'd have to apply like a point load there as well. And then if we were looking at the deflection diagrams for these, and this just starts to get a lot more complex, if I know what the deflection and the angle are for the first segment for this two EI beam with the shorter length, having a couple moment and a point load applied to it, if I can figure out what the deflection and rotation are right there, then I basically draw 
like a chord going out at that same angle and then just add the effects of like the second loading right here. How much is that second beam going to deflect? How much is that second beam going to have some additional rotation? And so it's kind of like taking a, a cantilever beam and then once you figure out how much it deflects and rotates, sticking another cantilever beam on the end and figuring out additional deflection, additional rotation. The key being that they both have different EIs. So I think it's valuable to think kind of conceptually about how can you use these standardized tools to apply to, to differing situations, but I'm not going to ask you to calculate it. I would ask you to try to, you know, diagram out how you would maybe add or subtract different loadings together. And again, it's just going to be a conceptual question if I ask it at all. Now, computationally, it's absolutely fair game to ask you about superposition of uh, beams in those tables where it's a lot more clear cut. A and the examples that we've seen of that would be this loading right here. Because in your, the back of your book, and I, I might be backwards on this, you have like this loading case and you have the entire beam loaded with a uniformly distributed load. And to mimic this, I would apply this and subtract this. And so that's absolutely valid because I'm not changing the geometry fundamentally. I'm not changing the, the uh, flexural stiffness fundamentally. Um, and this is just basically a superposition of loads on the same fundamental structure. Whereas these two examples, the geometry is significantly different and then that's where, again, the superposition, there are ways to get really close with it and be pretty accurate, but I don't want to get down that rabbit hole where we're trying to use superposition for like every possible situation because um, it ends up being either too confusing, the bookkeeping gets to be a nightmare, and we stop relying on these other methods that are more precise. And that's why conceptually I like talking about it and, and that would be fair game to talk about like how would you approach this problem on the test conceptually, but nothing computational like you would have for a problem like this. What else? We have just a couple more minutes left, but what else do you guys want to talk about? So out of those three topics, I'm kind of curious. So out of method of, uh, method of double integration for deflections, method of superposition for deflections, again, not these conceptual cases, but it's the computational one, and then virtual work for trusses, would you say that the deflection by integration is the hardest? Or wh which of those is the most challenging, do you think, for you? Integration. The integration method? Superposition. superposition. I think when you move the points around on superposition stuff, that can be kind of hard. Like right. When it's not a certain point or something like that. Yeah, and then, and then you know, uh, taking the elastic curve equation, taking the derivative of it to then be able to get the slope at any point, that gets to be a bit of a pain. It be kind of like messy. Uh-huh. Yeah, if it's not too hard, right. And again, with, with so many of these alternative theories, it's all about where is that point where you stop being comfortable with one and then it, it starts being less work with the other one or vice versa. So, yeah, what, Zora, what was it? Well, what I would say, I mean, with that kind of stuff on the exam is that partial credit is like a, a huge part of what you're going to get on the exam. So if you fully work out a problem and, and you mess up a sign somewhere, but you have the right equations, you set it up correctly, and, and you mess up the sign, or you took, you measured X from the right, you should have been uh, measuring it from the left, you're going to get the majority of those points. I mean, well above the majority. You're going to get 90% of the points for that problem. If you set it up correctly and you make some small stupid mistake, or even, even a smart mistake, right, uh, you're still going to get the majority upwards of, you know, almost full credit for just one small mistake like that. So one thing I've been telling my static students as well, too, is that you should not be erasing anything on the test. I'll have extra scratch paper. I give you a, a lot of space on the test as well, too. And don't erase a single thing. Uh, because I, you know, if you did something right and you thought it was wrong, then you erased it all. That wouldn't give me an opportunity to give you points, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, if, if you find that you did something wrong and you don't have time to go back and fix it, you're not going to fail the test, right? If you show your work, and even more importantly, if you find that you did something wrong and you know what you did wrong and you don't have time to fix it, write me a note and say, Evan, I know this is wrong because of this and this, and to fix it, I would do this and this. I've given people 100% credit, even though their work was wrong, because the one thing that they needed to fix, they didn't have time, but they told me what they were gonna do. And I gave them full points for that problem. And, and I'm fine with that too. That's almost more valuable to me than somebody erasing everything and then trying to start over, because I can't give them partial credit or even full credit for that. So. I understand time is gonna be critical, especially if you make a mistake and if you find it, but if you tell me what you did wrong and you show me that you know what you did wrong and you show me you know how to fix it, I, I wanna give you almost full credit or full credit for that. So, so that's, that's not a problem at all. Yeah? Something I could add to like the superposition, the way I figured out in the homework was, um, it's hard to think about, if, especially if there's like three pieces, it's hard to think about them all at once. So if there's like six pieces that could be part of it, mm -hmm, you've already mm -hmm. done double integration, you're pretty comfortable and you think you know what it is. Uh, what combination of those six pieces uh, gives, you, gives you the correct value? And then like, realistically, if you just do the pieces really quickly and just blaze them through the calculator, just get all the values, you can go back and put the pieces back together and see how they work together afterwards. And I found that more useful than just trying to like burn through it and, and what and so the other thing to remember is that our method of superposition works for method of integration. So if I ask you to do this beam, um, let's say this beam like here at the top, doing method of integration, you are 100% welcome to split it up into three different beams. Now, it may take a little bit more time, but you would have, I mean, Especially, let's say, like, let's say, like, this one right here. That's a better example where I, I have no, uh, if I ignore these two loads, the point load and the couple moment out of the end, and I only figure out what the deflection equation is for this loading right here, I have a moment equation for this section cut. This section cut, there's no moment at all, so the moment equation is zero, which is great that makes C3 and C4 a lot easier to calculate. Well, they won't be zero, but they, they, they're not gonna have a bunch of terms. And then I go back and I figure out, well, this point load right here, what is the equation for the deflection due to that point load? And then I can apply it, I can just add it to the first deflection and uh, uh, rotation equations and the second ones. And then I go back and I calculate what's the deflection equation for just the couple moment um, it might feel like it's taking a lot more time, um, but it might, it might give you a, more, a, a higher likelihood of being correct as well too. Now, I, I'm probably not gonna give you like this problem on the exam, but I'm saying if you have like two loads and one of them, you can split them up and look at each load individually, whatever your equation for y and theta are, for each of them separately, you just add them together and that's literally the correct answer. And so, so keep that in mind. You can split things apart for, super, for method of integration as well. Um, I understand you still have to calculate the constant of integration, but sometimes they split apart really cleanly and you can calculate them really, really quickly. So uh, something else to keep in mind. Yeah, Paulina. Do you say that you do like combined equations first and then integrate it? Or do you do integrate them first and then combine Yep, so I would look at, I would do the complete method of integration for each of these three loads independently because because look at what we're, we're looking at here. So for the first one, that's the trickiest one. That is this one here that requires two section cuts. But the section cut here, there's no moment, so it, it's really easy to calculate. You just get C3x plus C4. And solving for those is really easy once you've done it for this section. Then my second loading is this, and there's just one equation that applies all the way across the length, and the moment equation is just negative P times X which is great. And then this one here is just negative whatever this moment is, the entire length. And so going through and doing the, the full method of integration for each of these seems like it's gonna take forever, but these two are gonna be a snap. These, are, these two are gonna go so quick because if I'm measuring x from the left, right, c1, c2 equals zero for all of these cases. 
And so the only ones where you would ever have to solve for like C3 and C4 with a non-zero value would be just for the second section cut right there and there's no moment. And so, again, if I made you do this with method of integration, you could obviously check your work with the, the tables in the back of your book, but you could theoretically just split these up um, and do method of integration separately for each because they're gonna go really, really quick. Whereas if you don't, you're gonna have like three terms at least for each moment equation. That could be tricky. So do you recommend I'm just saying it's an option. So, and again, that's what you're learning about is, you know, what are you most comfortable with? And every, you know, if, you, if you're given the, the, the option and there's no reason I'd tell you, deal with all the loads at once or split them up. I'm not gonna tell you stuff like that. Um, and, and so it's up to you to figure out what you're most like comfortable with. But that, I'm just saying that's an option that a lot of people maybe don't think about. And unfortunately, I've got to wrap it up because I've, I've got to ride. I've got to get uh, out of here. Um, I will be available to, you know, answer as many questions as I can over the discussion boards. Uh, I've got the other midterm on Monday as well, too, so my time is going to be a bit at a premium. But don't hesitate to send me an email or post something. I'll try to get as much as I can. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you on Monday.